OTAN Outreach and Technical Assistance Network I want to give a, a shout out to Ryan De La Vega. I haven't seen him in a long time, but he is also an OTAN SME, and he was actually one of my first mentors on how to present. And so, um, because of him, I, I have been able to do a lot of presentations and really become kind of successful at it. So, thank you, Ryan. I'm super excited to see you here today. Um, all right, so let us get started because I really want to try to make room at the end of this presentation to do a live demonstration on OWL. If you were at the CASA session a, a, a little while ago, then I was able to do it for about a minute or two, but um, I really wanted to share with you um, how we use the OWL in our classrooms. Um, I, I've done this presentation, this particular topic, probably this is probably my 10th one in about six months. And, and it, it has evolved in time because um, because our system has also changed and you know we've uh, really kind of taken what has been working and what hasn't been working and, and moving with that. But also because of the feedback from the field, from, from all of you, the participants, about what you uh, wanted to hear more about, what you really didn't want to hear too much about um, and things like that. So I've actually morphed this presentation quite a few times. And so um, one of the big things was about the OWL. What is at the beginning, nobody really wanted to hear about the OWL. And if you're, if you're listening to me and you're having no, no idea what I'm saying right now, an OWL is a three camera that has a built-in speaker and microphone in our classroom. And so um, I can talk about it a little bit and then demonstrate it. As time has been going on, um, more and more agencies tend to have been interested in more about it. So I do want to make sure that I include some of it, but not take up too much time. So let me go ahead and get started. So my name is Alisa Takeuchi. I am an ESL instructor for Garden Grove Adult Education. And um, we have been very fortunate in a couple of aspects is that our district has really opened up the school, our school quite early. Uh, we, we started, we were online remote during the pandemic for uh, one year, exactly. So I was teaching remotely for 367 days. Um, and then we actually were able to open our school back up again in March, one year ago. Uh, recently. So um, we have been one of the first schools to actually open up its doors for students. And I'll tell you about the, the challenges and successes of that. Um, I, I also do work for OTAN with uh, Debbie Ryan, and um, I am a subject matter expert. So I, I think this is how the agenda is going to go, depending on time. Um, I'll do a quick introduction and some background about my school, and then we'll talk a little bit about pandemic because I really want to use that as an opportunity to show how the transition went. So for some of you here, and this is actually going to be kind of an interactive, so if you're thinking about multitasking, you might want to stop because I'm going to ask, be asking you some questions and having you um, reply in the chat um, because I really do like to get a feel for the room and then just to kind of get some information about where people are at. Um, I will talk about how we as an agency prepared for uh, what we call high flex, which is a simultaneous instruction. And then from there, I will talk about how do I do the instruction that engages both the in-class and the online students, and then successes and challenges. So a little bit of background. Um, my school is actually called Lincoln Education Center. We're part of the Garden Grove Unified School District, the K through 12 system. We are southern from, we are south from Los Angeles. Uh, we're right probably in between Los Angeles and San Diego. Uh, my school is, uh, for reference, 1.5 miles away from Disneyland, if that kind of gives you an idea of where we are. Our population is primarily Vietnamese right now. Um, we do ha have a lot of um, Latinos in our our population at school. And then we used to have quite a few Koreans, but they have actually moved on to another city. They've, they've kind of migrated um, to another city next to us. All right, so if you could in the chat, I'd really like to know what part you take in adult education. Are you an ESL instructor? And if you are, what level do you teach? Are you CTE, HSE, ABE, um, you know, everything like that. If you could type that in the chat, that would be fantastic. And I actually, uh, let's see here. Let me get my chat up so I can see. Maybe you you have multiple hats. You, know, you can 
type that in there too. Admin, yeah, I've got, I see admin. <laughs> Resources, academic. Wow, we've got a full gamut. Nice. Thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate that. And I, you know, I usually do this at the very beginning. I thought I had a slide on here, but if you could do me, a, if you haven't done it yet, if you could do me a favor, if you could put your name and your agency, um, that would be fantastic too. I, I uh, usually that's an OTAN thing, but I really do enjoy. Uh, I do go back to the chats after my sessions, and I read, I read all the chats, and I read the questions and things like that in case I miss something um, during the session. So I appreciate that. Thanks. Oopsie. Nope. So I'd also like to know kind of what uh, models of instruction, model or models of instruction you're currently um, using at your agency, whether it be online only still or in class only still, or are you doing some sort of high flex or are you doing some sort of distance learning? Um, I'd like to get to know what types of uh, instruction are being offered at your school. So Carla is doing in-person and online, simultaneously or separated. Audrey at Sweetwater is doing in-person and distance learning. I know I just had a conversation with her that, um, that they are thinking about doing the high flex soon. Oh, still remote, yeah, in-person. Yeah, a lot of you are still, uh, you know, it's, yeah, Patrick is still doing in-person, online and hybrid. So you're offering a variety of, of of instruction. Great, yeah, I love it. Um, like I said earlier, um, Garden Grove, all of our classes, all of our classes and all of our departments are using the high flex model, um, whether that be just uh, whether or not they have students in each uh, in simul um, online or in class, um, because we give the students a choice. So upon uh, online registration, the students will choose whether, you know, which mode of instruction they would like. All right, so this will be the last one I think for a while. So what are your thoughts when you hear simultaneous instruction? Are you like, huh, what's that? Or, ah, I don't know. Or, hey, I'm okay, or I'm open to it. <laughs> What are your thoughts when you hear simultaneous? So some of you maybe you know are in in the thick of it right now. Some of you are thinking about it. You know, come fall or maybe your summer school classes. Um. Oh, nice, Elaine. Yeah, first high flex with an owl. Yeah, see, you got it. You got it from the get go. Nice. Yes, Clara. I, that's exactly right. It it is a learning curve. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right, Ryan, too. And that's a big issue right now upon, you know, I can't make these flat statements or these, you know, umbrella statements with all of you because we all have different um, capabilities within our agency, funding, tech, you know, support, things like that. And so all I can do really is give you my perspective from our agency, but I do understand that there are, you know, that we are very lucky here, but I do for three months, you know, I did have a different situation so I can give you that perspective as well. Nice, Scott, I love the enthusiasm. Good, all right, let's get going. So again, this is what we're talking about. This is straight from our online registration, which we had to create when we went pandemic because we were the traditional students came into our office and filled out, you know, huge long triplicate that had all the WIO, you know, information and stuff on it. And then we just, we developed a, a Google form and translated all that information onto the Google form. And we added this question, do you want to be in person or online? So the students have a choice. And it wasn't that they were going to be in person in one class and online in a totally different class. They were actually going to be in person or online in the same class. Uh, yeah, Christine, I hear you because I do I do beginning uh, students as well. And we'll talk about that. 
All right, so this might look pretty familiar uh, from March 2020 to March 2021. Uh, my class was solely online. Uh, Pre-pandemic, I had about 40 students in class. Uh, once March 17th happened, I had 16. <laughs> so um, I lost more than half of my class. And you know, no matter what, no matter all the outreach that I did, the texting, the emailing, the calling, having the liaisons call, you know, in their language, um, I just uh, some of the students just did not come back. And you know, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, as time went on, I I gained a lot of new students, which was a real surprise to us because we had students that weren't able to come to our school before. Because because they live far away. So a couple of the students that you see in this picture, they lived in Fullerton, which is about, I don't know, maybe a 40 minute drive. So of course they weren't going to be driving to our school every day, but having an online class was the perfect solution for them. So we actually gained some other students that we weren't expecting. So in March of 2021, one year after we um, started remote learn, uh, instruction, we got the call saying that our school was going to be opened in April. And so uh, the last week of March, the teachers were allowed to come back to school for the first time and really kind of decide how they wanted their classroom to look. And so I came back, I had a vision in my head of what I thought I wanted my class, but then I, I kind of had to see what, what it would look like. I knew I wasn't going to be behind my desk, which you, I didn't really take a good picture of it, but it's right here. My desk, my teacher desk is here and I, and I have a desktop computer on there, but I knew I didn't want to be stuck behind my desk because then I wouldn't really be able to engage well with the in-class students. So I moved my workstation to the front of the class. And so then at the time, you know, we really did have restrictions about how many students can be. We could only have 18 students in the classroom, uh, which was not a problem, and I'll tell you about in a minute. But, um, you know, we had the plexiglass. I had to wear the double masks. You know, this was at the, the very beginning of opening back th opening things back up. And then as you can see in the picture, um, I have my Zoom students. So I was still teaching my class in my classroom with my Zoom students. where We were preparing to open the doors, and that was going to happen in April. So here's another viewpoint of my teacher workstation. Um, I have my laptop on a podium at the time uh, because I needed my computer to be up high because I was going to be standing or at least sitting in a high chair. And because um, on the desk, it was too low. So I, I had this podium in my classroom from before. And so I was just using that. Sometimes I would put it on the table on a stack of books. And so again, I really wanted my computer to be up higher. And so I would just put it on, on a pile of books. And this is another, now you can see that I have my laptop computer. And then um, in the back, you can also see that I have an electronic whiteboard with a projector. And that we had prior to the pandemic. Um, we had just upgraded and we had smart boards, um, but they were antiquated. And so we had actually just started the process of getting the classrooms upgraded. And one of my, my classroom just happened to be one of them. And then school shut down and we didn't use them for over a year. So, um, this was my Zoom class, and um, I was all excited. We knew in March, I mean, in April, we were going to be open. And I said, okay, who wants to come back to class? I had four students who raised their hand. And so um, looking back, uh, we didn't force anybody. Uh, there was no question. If they wanted to stay online, that was great. If they wanted to come to school, that was great, too. The four that um, are circled, I'm actually really glad that they actually chose to come back to class because they were kind of the ones that were struggling online. They were very consistent and very loyal and they came to school all the time, but it wasn't easy for them, whether they had distractions at home or their internet was not so good, or, you know, they, they still struggled with their devices. Um, so I, I was actually kind of glad that they chose to come back to school. Uh, and, and I think they were too. They were very happy when, you know, when they found out that school was going to reopen. So April 3rd, we um, opened up our doors. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We had all we had to do a whole orientation. We had two different orientations. We had an in-class orientation and then we had online orientation as well. So the in-class um, orientation was for all of these students who were going to be leaving Zoom and coming into the class because we had so many health restrictions. I didn't add any of those uh, slides as I had before in previous presentations because that stuff is over now. We, you know, most of you who are going to open your schools up again. Um, probably won't have to go through the same um, structures that we had to go through at that time. So I didn't include those um, slides in there, but we did do a whole orientation on what was expected of the students. 
So here's my new classroom now. <laughs> um, I have my four students that said that they wanted to come back. As you can see, I have my workstation. And then on the far right on my um, electronic whiteboard, you'll see that those are my Zoom students. So my in-class students could see my Zoom students, but my Zoom students couldn't see my in-class students unless I physically took my laptop and I flipped it around and showed the camera to them. And I did that every once in a while so that they, they could wave hi because they really missed each other for a whole year. They were um, in class together on Zoom and they really formed this bond and now some of them has separated uh, from that and so the zoom students um, kind, you know kind of missed them so at the beginning of class I, I would turn my laptop sometimes now as this you know as my progress is moving along uh, and I did this presentation I had a lot of teachers go oh you know you could put a, a, an external camera on your you know laptop facing toward the students and I went genius you know, at the time I was just, you know, surviving. I was just trying to figure out how I could do this. And I didn't have a lot of um, ideas in front of me to, to take from. But as time has gone by, I had gotten a lot of suggestions and I thought, oh man, I wish I would have known this three months ago. So here comes curriculum. So we at Gardner Grove uh, for the ESL department, we all use ventures um, from beginning literacy all the way through academic. And so uh, ventures from Cambridge, they offer, um, they have the whole book, everything is um, digital. I have access to the digital textbook and things like that, resources, worksheets, everything uh, we had that was available digitally, which really helped during the remote sessions because we were able to get all those resources and put them in Google Classrooms. Um, so now that I'm in the class and um, teaching online at the same time, I could just project anything, you know, that I was teaching in that particular unit on the whiteboard, share my screen. So now both the in-class students and the online students could see it at the same time. I also use Oxford, um, I usually use um, Oxford Picture Dictionary, OPD. And so again, I use the old version because we hadn't uh, adopted the new edition. So I've been using the second edition for a long time. And so um, I still had the, uh, the presentation tools. And so even though it's, it's kind of, you know, a little bit on the older side and stuff, it really helped. And again, I was able to project it onto my, my whiteboard and I shared my screen and everybody could see it at the same time. My in-class students had access to the books as well, because we still had, um, a classroom sets of books that students could use that we hadn't been touched for you know a year um they had access to that and then the online students they uh, a lot of them they bought the book they, they both of the books they they thought that it was a good investment for them to actually have the book with them um we did do a little check out if if some of my students couldn't afford it or they really just didn't want to buy it they could come to i i checked some of the textbooks out to them and so that they could have that book but they you know of course they couldn't write and use it like that um, for EL Civics, uh, we had to really kind of upgrade our EL Civics in that we took all of the tasks and things like that as much as we could. We put we made them digital, whether it was a Google form or you know a doc or some sort of um, digital tool for the materials and for the tasks. And so like with CASA's test, we had to, you know, do everything online remotely. And it was a big learning curve. It was really difficult when we were remote only. As we were um, opening up the doors, then uh, we were doing both at the same time. So, so my in-class students were doing it on paper and my online students were doing it online. So... <clears throat> When I was in the classroom full time, um, we used the little mini whiteboards um, for formative assessment. I would prompt something, I would ask them a question, they would write furiously on their whiteboards, they would show it to me, and I could tell very, in, you know, real quick who got it and who didn't. I can do some um, feedback right away. When we went remote, I used the chat for this. And so we used a Zoom, but uh, you know, almost every virtual meeting platform has some sort of chat. And we did this every single day. So one of the benefits of the online instruction is that the students' typing skills, whether it was texting or typing, man, it increased exponentially. Be, you know, of course, at first it was awful and it was suffering and, and, you know, they were so slow, not a problem. We just kept doing it every day, every day, every day. And they just took off with it. It was incredible how, how fast they became in a very short amount of time. So as you can see on the left, um, I used the chat for everything for, uh, you know, everything. So this was particularly, um, it was dictation. 
So I would say the word and the online student would type the word. Um, and then in this particular unit, we also learned about um, proper nouns. So as you see at the bottom of that left chat, um, now we're going from the regular library and you know we're going on to uh, the names of places so main street costco gas station so again these are like typing skills now i'm having to teach them shift you know and whatever letter is shift whatever letter to make it a capital i really was emphatic about not having them use cap locks because a lot of times those cap locks type one letter uncap block and so i wanted to teach them the proper way of typing even though if they were still doing one finger typing or texting it was still important to me to show them how to do it properly up at the top um, you can see that we practiced our alphabet and so this was really good chat was really good because i was still getting new students it wasn't like my same set of students all the time so i always continually had to go back and and teach the alphabet and we went over the alphabet many many times so that those new students could get those skills that they had missed you know, when they weren't in class and so as you can see uh, for this on the second line, uh, Rokia, she wrote the alphabet, but she was missing one letter. And I would tell her, I said, oh, Rokia, you have 25, we need 26. I wouldn't tell her what letter was missing. So she had to go back and look and see. And then you can see that she retyped it with the, with the missing letter. Um, also in the bottom for the chat, we did sentences. We, you know, we have now grown and we've done some uh, dictation sentences. So I would say the sentence, my teacher is Alisa. And I would repeat that, repeat that, repeat that. And then the in-class the in class students are typing on in chat. And um, you, again, you can see Rukia. I said, oh, Rukia, you know, we're missing our, uh, remember, you know, a period, remember period. And so then she, she went back and she corrected herself. And I can see the chat right away. I can give her some feedback right away and that she can correct herself right away. So if you haven't been using, if you're still online or you still are, or you still have online students, I highly, highly recommend that you start using that chat all the time. And it's for any level. You could do it for anything for any level. So here are my four wonderful students in class. And again, like I said, all they, they were doing the exact same um, instruction, but they are now showing me their little whiteboards and I can go back and I can just see who's got it and who doesn't. So I'm engaging both the um, in-class students and the online students at the exact same time. All right, so for about a week, I just had my, um, my laptop in my home office, when I was doing the remote things, I had a, a second monitor, an external monitor. And when I came back into the classroom, for whatever reason, I didn't, I don't know, I didn't bring it or I didn't think about it. And after about a week of just having my laptop, I said, nope, I, and I brought my external monitor from home into the classroom. Again, fortunately, because um, there was kind of a need for it, uh, our, our, director, she actually was able to order more external monitors for anybody who wanted them. Um, so I really enjoy using external monitor. There is a little learning curve on that as well. You have to navigate between two screens. It's like having two separate computer computers. What you can do on your computer, you can also do on your second monitor. So as you can see, I have my Zoom students on my laptop. I have my Google Doc on the external monitor. And then if you look in the very back, it has a mirror of what it is on the back, on the monitor. So my external monitor, my monitor number two is extended. And then from number two to my projector, it's mirrored. So everything that I, I, I want to showcase, whether it's a Google presentation or ventures or Google Docs, whatever it is, I put it on my big monitor and then that mirrors onto the electronic whiteboard. So everybody and I share my screen so everybody can see it at the same time. All right. So here's another interactive uh, uh, portion. How comfortable are you currently with a second monitor? Are you like, huh? What's that? Are you like, oh, I've used it once and I didn't like it or hey, no problem, I'm good. <laughs> Audrey needs a third monitor. Okay, let's just not get crazy here. Um, I remember that Anthony Burek one time I did this presentation and he offered that too. <laughs> oh, Patricia never used it. Yeah, again, it's it's one of those things where if you feel very comfortable um, with your laptop only, that's great. But if you're if you're able to really kind of vision that you can extend this now to another monitor, I think it's going to be very very helpful for you. I'm just going to go up real fast because I did see a question, but it went to you guys are chatting so fast. I mean, you're typing so fast, I couldn't see it. Yeah, no problem, uh, David. Uh, did I, you I get, will try to do that. 
did you get Claire's question? I'm pretty comfortable with it. So when you went to group activities, did you show the other students then to each other? Um, so when you went to group activities, did you show the other students? Did you show the other students then to each other? I I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question, but um, with my second monitor, yeah, a lot of times. Uh, so, uh, okay, so I think I'm going to answer it, but I'm not sure. So, um, Claire, if you want to re, if I don't answer it, come back into the chat. So, in the more every single morning before we start class, I put the Zoom students on my big monitor, which project, projects to the electronic uh, board. And every morning, my in class students and my Zoom students, they say hi to each other. So, they're having a little morning conversation with each other. And the reason I can do this now is because I have the owl. Before I had an owl, I would again have to turn my um, my laptop around so that the camera was facing the students. But again, I could do that. I could um, have this little like morning meet and greet type thing so that the students could see each other. Um, you know, what, what before I had the other technology. Um, oh, right. Yeah. So Ryan brings up a really good point about, you know, losing stuff that's what was happening with me that first week when I had only my laptop is that I lost everything. You know, my Zoom was here, but then my presentation was back here. And then, you know, where's this? And I, you know, I was searching around, I was wasting a lot of time just looking for stuff because they were buried in these layers that now that I can separate it, I can keep certain things on one monitor and other things on the other monitor. So when we first opened the school, I always kept my Zoom students on my laptop because I wanted to face the camera. I wanted to face them and the camera so they can see me. If I put it on my other monitor, like now you can notice I, I'm looking away. And so it was kind of disengaging. Um, once I got the owl, it, that solved a lot of problems, but I will get to that later. Oopsie, sorry. See, even now with the second monitor. <laughs> All right, so we did it. We finished the full, the first kind of school year it was only a, a few months. So it was April through June of 2021. We were in school, we were open, we were accepting um, new students um, in class or online. And, and we, we really kind of worked out some of the kinks that were happening. Now, I will just kind of give you a disclaimer. Um, in my beginning literacy class, you saw I had those four in-class students from that transferred over from Zoom. I ended up reaching out to some of my students that ha had been in my class pre-pandemic, and I gave it one last go. I'm like, hey, school is open again. I really want you to come back to class. I got two more students. So now I had six students in my class, and I had 24 online. And um, that's pretty much how it, I ended the school year. And so... Uh, I wanted to just let you know that, um, I kind of lost my train of thought, but I did want to let you know that, yeah, I did not have very, oh, so that's what it was. I had six in-class students and I was the highest attending in-class class at our school. So a lot of teachers had zero students in class. We offered it, but nobody took it. So we had a lot of classes, a lot of teachers who had zero uh, in-class students and still remained only teaching online in their classroom. So they had not experienced the high flex yet. So for three months, there were only a few of us that had actual in-class. Some of them had one, some had two, I had six, and the other beginning literacy teacher at night had four. And he was also the highest attending in-class um, uh, in class class at night. So the two beginning literacy classes had the most in-class attendance. And I did read in the comments earlier about how um, the beginning level students tended to kind of want to come back into the classroom. And I agree with that. So now what? We did three three months of kind of experimentation, you know, what worked, what didn't. And so now in June, before we started the next school year, we really sat down. There was a group of us that sat down and said, Let's think about what we want our next school year to look like. We knew we were going to do high flex. That was very um, em emphatic on our, our director's uh, view. And that, and we knew that um, it wasn't going to go just in class or just online. We were going to offer both. And there was a little pushback from the district, but we, you know, we explained to them about how adults are different than K through 12 because K through 12 were all solely in class. There was no more virtual learning. And so we just said the needs of our adult students were different than the K through 12 and they agreed. So then we, we said, okay, now that we know we're going to be 
um, high flex still, what are our goals? And so we created some SMART goals. We needed to decide which personnel, which office staff, or which teachers, or which whomevers were going to be kind of delegated these tasks or in charge of certain things. And that was a big deal for us because we really use the strengths of our support staff to further broaden their job skills and really had us help them help us with some of the other um, tasks that needed to get done. And that was really great for everybody. Um, our director had to decide what, you know, take inventory of everything. What do we have already that we can still use? What do we need? How much is it going to cost? And when's it going to come? So she had to go through all of that with, you know, of course, our budget and things like that. We, um, that was when we, she and our counselor went to a presentation at Huntington Beach Adult School, who's our um, adult ed um, uh, cohort in our consortium and they introduced us to the owl and my director was blown away and she was like we need those and so she realized that you know with the owls that we were already doing high flex in a way that this was only going to make um, our experiences better for everybody so she purchased the owls and we ended up getting eight right away I, I think she purchased maybe 16 and the other ones were out in a cargo ship out on the shore of Long Beach for months and months and months. So we only got eight at the initial um, initial run through. And it was a really good thing that we did because she was actually able to get them at a cheaper price than they are now. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Al later, but I mean, they are expensive. They're about a thousand bucks a piece. So, I mean, you know, admins are like, Ugh, you know, and I understand that. So that's why I'm saying, you know, it's not equitable for everybody, but it does work if you can, you know, work it into your budget. And then we rolled it out. So come August, now our new school year, the school year that we're starting right now, is starting, then all the teachers that have an owl are now going to start to use it. And we're starting to play with it. We had TOSAs from our K through 12 come and help us. Um, the custodians were an integral part of installation. The owls themselves, easy installation. It's two plugs, one to my computer and then one to um, the outlet. That's it. So in its basic form, the owls are very, very user friendly as far as setup goes. But because Alisa, we also, yes. We have a question about your SMART goals. They want, she, uh, Audrey wants to know, will you please share what your SMART goals were? Oh, okay. Um, let me finish this thought and then I'll go back to it. Uh, what was my thought? Oh, uh, because <laughs> because we are, um, because we have our interactive whiteboard, we did have to get some connections, you know, some HDM. So the for admins who are thinking about purchases, um, HDMI cables are going to be like probably on your list, <laughs> and also maybe some hubs or some ports because you're going to use up a lot. You're you know the, with more stuff you're gonna use up more ports. And so, you know, our USB ports are starting to get filled up. You know, we have the, the outlet on my wall to connect our electronic whiteboard. You know, that was starting to get plugged up. Um, uh, the outlets, we only have two, you know, here and maybe two someplace else. So I had to get a power strip. So those are like kind of the things that we had to think about as far as purchases go um, to really kind of make everything work. Now, go back to the SMART goals. Um, one of the SMART goals is, was that we would, um, it was about the pilot. We were going to, you know, uh, teachers will pilot the OWL and report on its findings by the end of the semester or something like that. Um, we were, another goal was to um, redevelop our orientations, um, our in-class orientation and our online orientation. We had kind of a makeshift one because we were desperate and we had to make it out real fast. But then from the experience and the time, we revamped that. So that was another one of our goals. And then um, the third one, I think, was um, in regards to, um, oh, in regards to getting everybody a Google Classroom. I, all the teachers were going to develop a Google Classroom um, in, in, in every department, no matter, not just ESL. Every department was going to create a Google Classroom and that we were going to uh, become a Google school. And then uh, in addition to that was that our students were now going to start using um, our school email address. That wasn't available to us earlier. And so the, the school district actually gave all of our students a .NET, a ggusd.net account. And so one of our goals was to start incorporating that. And, and it's still an ongoing process. We don't have everybody on board just yet, but come the next school year, our goal is to get um, uh, all the teachers on board with that. So thank you for that question. 
All right, so that was in June. We did the planning. Um, one of the things that we did change was marketing um, and we went to postcards. And in July, we sent out postcards and uh, it was a big money saver. And if you go to um, the session at two, the next session, um, Melissa, my director and myself, we're gonna be with Marjorie and some, uh, some uh, the IT director and stuff from Ocalanus. They're also gonna be talking about, we're gonna talk about equipment and money. And so uh, we sent out postcards to three years worth of students. Anybody who was en uh, enrolled in our class, in our school for the past three years, got mailed this um, postcard and the postcard referred them to our website. So that was another thing that we did. We really updated our website. We were able to gain control of it because it used to be somebody from our district office. And so um, we gained control of our website. So that was a big help. So that was another free resource that we could use. And so instead of students coming into uh, the office to get all the information to register, we referred everybody to the website and they could do the registration. They can get information. They learned about our you know, course catalog, things like that. Um, about two, within two weeks of sending those postcards, we got 720 new student registrations. No joke, 720. We were blown away. And the biggest blow away was 80% of those students wanted to be in class. So if you can remember, I had four, right? From transitioning from online to in class, I had four and then I gained two more, I had six. All of a sudden now, every new student, 80% of the new students that wanted to start learning at our school wanted to be in class. So we were just like, what happened? Where did this come from? So, you know, uh, restrictions were, you know, starting to be more lax. The the COVID was kind of going down. This is before Omicron, pre-Omicron, right? And so people were becoming more, um, they felt safer to come back to class. And we very, we really, really um, showcased, displayed all of our health safety issues. We really showed students, this is what we are doing to make sure that you feel safe at our school. Everything from all the cleanest, you know, just the normal things that schools were going through and that we, you know, we were doing health screenings, we were doing temperature checks, we were doing all of that stuff. And so I think the students felt more comfortable about being in class again. Can you go over the online registration process? Yes, uh, I might have a slide. I don't know if I have a slide on it, but uh, anyways, yes. So the students go on, go on to our website and then we have a big, you know, big banner saying register here, you know, look at our course catalog, register here. And so then the students um, fill out their information with their name, their, you know, their normal personal information. And then again, that, that little indentation about whether they wanted to be in class or um, online. And then they had the WIOA uh, information and everything was translated into Vietnamese and Spanish because those are two uh, highest languages that we have that we serve and so um, then once they uh, click on submit it goes to our clerk and then he has the google sheet that you know that aggregates all that information and then from there he schedules he tells them when our orientation is so we scheduled our orientations once a week um, every thursday in the morning and at night and um, at the very beginning when i saw when you saw those 720 we are actually doing it uh, four days a week, three times a day. So we wanted to get all those students pushed in. And then as you know, as they were, it was getting lower and lower, then we just, we made it one day a week. And so then that's when they got all the information about being an in-class student or being an online student and what that means. And then, uh, and then once they finished the orientation, then he was able to, oh, and so then the, we also incorporated the CASAS test. So the students had to come to school, they had to do the orientation, and right away they did the CASAS test. So we got to pretest all of the students right away, which is a big, big thing for us because it was very difficult during the uh, online part of it. That whole year we were um, off campus um, to get the students pretested and post tested because the remote testing was um, not working on our campus. Like I was able to do it one on one, but of course I can't do it, you know, it takes a long time and I can only do one student at a time. So that was another whole issue. So we were able to incorporate the e test at the same time. So that really helped us a lot. All right. So as you can see, this is my class. This was in October. I took it a little bit late, but you can see, um, you know, the tides had turned. So if you notice, or what do you notice? Um, you know, I have far more 
in-class students. And then if you look on the computer, I have two. <laughs> I had two Zoom students. So except for those six that carried over from the other semester, everybody else is new. They're all new students that are in that in my um, in class. And then I still had my two Zoom students um, on my Zoom. Um, the other students, the other, like you said, oh, Lisa, you had 24 Zoom students. What happened to them? I promoted them. Yeah, you know, they had been in my class for over a year. Some of them had been already been in my class a year before the pandemic. We didn't promote anybody during the pandemic because we really needed students to kind of um, learn how to be online students. And so we didn't really feel like we felt like it, they could be like, okay staying in the same level. So some of them were in my class for two years. And so now it was finally time for them to promote. So they went on to the next level, beginning low as online students. Um, so that's why my, my Zoom student ratio went down quite a bit. So I just want to let you know that some of the things I was thinking about this this morning about what really worked. So, I, you know, I, I think all of you have this maybe I'm hoping fingers crossed. The last two years are kind of a blur. I kind of get things kind of mixed up between what happened in 2020 versus 2021. And so some of my information might be overlapping or like in the wrong order. But from what I can recall, <laughs> the things that worked for us for the uh, the year that we came back is that a on the top for sure. Number one, we had a supportive and um, administer, administrator. She was brand new. She wasn't brand new to adult ed. She was one of our ESL teachers at first, and then she became a principal um, throughout our district in the K through 12. And she was still a night administrator once a week. And so she knew our program. She knew it from the teacher's point of view, and she knew it from a somewhat pseudo administrative view. And then when our oldest administrator uh, changed positions, she took over. And so this was her first year. So, you know, congratulations to her. She started a whole new program under pandemic. And um, she was nothing but supportive for us uh, the whole time. She was learning while we were learning and she understood. And she provided so much professional development for us that I can't emphasize enough to you administrators is key. Um, you know, it really, it takes, it takes a lot to, for the teachers to really learn how to be teachers again. We all knew how to do it in class, and then we really had to learn how to do it online in a very short amount of time, and OTAN was a big part of that. And now it's like bringing, a, bringing you know, the best of both worlds together, and, and teachers are, are feeling like they're, they're rocking on the, you know, on the boat a little bit. They're not steady yet. Um, our online orientation really provided a lot of support for our students who were going to be online students. Um, again, that second monitor really helped and and some of our teachers are not on board with it yet. Uh, they're kind of interested, but it's just too much like just knowing what they know on the laptop is fine for them and we're fine with that. But anybody who was like interested in getting a second monitor, um, we, pro we provide that for them. The digital textbook, like I said, luckily, because we had just adopted ventures uh, two years prior to the pandemic. And so we were kind of getting used to the, the textbook and all of the components and how to use it all. And luckily for us, we were at that point where we weren't new with it anymore. So when we went to remote, it was a, a somewhat easier transition. And then uh, the flexibility on our administrators, on our support staff, on the teachers, on the students, everybody was very flexible. We didn't know what was going to happen week by week. We were getting health, you know, updates. Are we going to close? Can we still stay open? You know, masks, no masks, temperature checks, blah, blah, blah. So everybody was very um, understanding about all the different changes that were happening at very quick times. We have two questions. Okay. Uh, the first one is more about those orientations, the online orientations, and how did those work? The question was, were orientations online or in person? And then more about those. So let's do that question, and then I'll ask the second. OK, so I'm going to do it real quick, because I, I've got to get stuff done. And I really want to do the owl if I can. So the online orientation, um, I developed this online tour orientation so that I met with we the students made an appointment with me to come online. And then I checked to make sure, did they have a Zoom account? Was their name on the bottom of the Zoom screen? Um, could they mute? Could they unmute? Uh, stop video, start video, chat um, using like uh, capital letters, periods, 
things like that. Just basic kind of chat. I didn't go very much into it. So they had to type, um, you know, my name is and their name. They had to type, how are you? They had to type, I am fine or I'm fine. Things like that. So kind of basic things in chat. And then I evaluated them. I kind of vetted them to see how is their Wi-Fi. I asked them all, what devices are you on? So that I could kind of troubleshoot. Again, not everybody can do this because if you are trying to troubleshoot, you need to know a lot of different uh, devices. And that was really, I had to do a lot of homework because I don't use Apple products. So I had to learn, you know, like, what does it look, what does the text screen look like on an iPhone? Or, you know, what does it look, what does the keypad look like on an iPad? You know, things like that. So I had to go back and do some research um, on my own to, to help the students who were using Apple products. And then uh, were they on a laptop, a desktop, a Chromebook, you know, things like that. So I was checking to make sure I checked their um, noise, you know, background. Um, I, you know, and I made some suggestions sometimes. Um, they were walking with their phone to another room and I had to kind of stop them and let them know, you know, please don't walk with your Zoom, stop video, go to your destination, start video, things like that. So, cause a lot of times that first, that interaction with me on Zoom was their first time using Zoom. So, you know, just getting used to seeing me on the screen or them with other people on a screen so that they had a good idea of what it was gonna look like in the classroom. The in-class um, orientation, the students came and um, I just gave them kind of the, at the time, at the beginning, it was about all about the health things, getting a temperature check, doing the um, health screenings, making sure they had a mask and then I would take them on a little campus tour and show them where the bathroom was, where the office was, where their classroom was. So I, we were kind of going on a little field trip and then, um, then they were on their way. So then they were prepared. And then I would show them which parking lot to you know, park in depending on where their class was so that they knew from the first day of their class they felt a little bit familiar about where things were or where, who to ask if they didn't, you know, if they needed more information. Um, I'm going to jump to this uh, slide real quick, Debbie. So hang on. Um, so what didn't work at first? At, you know, first, I called this challenges, but it was, and they were, but they were kind of things that happened and we realized they weren't going to work and we changed it. So again, I was telling you about the headset and microphone. Um, I wish I would have known to do the external camera and to use the microphone from my computer instead of using a, uh, wearing a, he a headset all the time. I definitely would have changed that. The workstation angle, if, if you noticed in those pictures, I was facing directly in front of the students with my workstation. I now angle it. I, I, I'm directly like diagonal to them so that I can see the whole broad spectrum instead of just seeing like the front and looking this way. Um, power outlets and cables, I really went through and decided which power cables do I need, um, how many do I need, and where are they going to be plugged in, and I made a, an inventory list, and I gave it to our custodian, our IT guy, and our administrator, and they were very, very good about getting it all done, and then um, using a non-digital curriculum um, was a challenge. I, I didn't know how to do that. So it was either I recreated some worksheets or I figured out how to get the digital, you know, because of copyright, you know, I wasn't going to just, you know, scan it and use it and things unless I had permission, which a lot of times we could because of the education, um, you know, I don't know what it's called right now, but you know, we could use it for educational purposes. But at some point I, I just had to recreate a lot of that. So that was kind of a bummer in that it took me a little bit more time to do some of my digital lessons. All right, so real quick, I'm going to talk about uh, the owl. So high tech at a high price. So that actual want button, that was my director. As soon as she saw them, she wanted them. And she hit that little button, she made it happen. So this I would like to introduce is, um, is the OWL camera. We call him Mr. Hoot. And so when you plug him in and you get him all set up, he actually hoots. He goes, hoo, hoo. And so that's how you know it's working. And you know, it's so cute. The design is perfect and things. So as you can see on the top, there is a camera and it is a 360 degree camera. It's almost like a Google Maps camera, you know, when you see on the top of the cars. The two eyeballs, um, I that that's just kind of an indicator that they are working. The whole bottom part is um the speaker and then the microphone is set in there and it's it's powerful. The speakers and the microphone are very powerful. I can walk around anywhere in my room and I, I usually speak at a little bit above normal voice just because I'm a little afraid that it wasn't going to work that well, but and that's just what I do anyways. Um, but everybody says that they can hear me just fine or somebody else in the classroom too. 
So this is what it looks like. Um, the owl sits on a table at the front of the class, front and center. And um, now the teacher, Ray, who's on the right, he is able to walk away from his laptop, right? The camera that is originally on his laptop, he's able to walk away. And now this is the camera. I was sitting in the, uh, in the classroom and I took this picture. So he's able to go to the front of the board. And at the top, you see a big banner. That's the whole classroom. So people who are looking at the owl view can see the whole classroom on the top and then on the bottom is either a one screen a split screen or a triplicate screen depending on the motion and the speed of that particular time. It's not instantaneous. So if I say something, the owl doesn't pick me up right away. It doesn't go Purr, and it's it, it, it does kind of scan the room and it goes a little bit slowly. So some of the challenges are that if I'm having a conversation with a student and then our conversation ends, by the time it picks up that student, we've already finished our conversation and I've moved on to someone else. So, you know, again, it's not 100% perfect, but it is um, really nice. The Zoom students really benefit from it because they really feel like they're part of the classroom now instead of just this Zoom screen. And so that's been really, really helpful. This is what it looks like um, as a student on their phones. So as you can see, there's that big banner on the top. You can see the bottom, it's a split screen. Uh, it's picking up uh, two different pieces because the woman on the right is talking as well as uh, the guy in the back is talking. So it's kind of split the screen because it, it can't discern what's happening. So it will just, so me as the Zoom student on my phone, I can see, oh, this is what's happening in the classroom. And I feel engaged with whatever's happening. I can hear what they're saying. And then they can also hear me if I decide to talk. In the top right corner, you'll see me. That's, um, that's the Zoom, uh, no sharing screen. So that's just me with my video off and it's a thumbnail. So the students have to learn how to toggle between the thumbnail and the owl view, depending on what's, what's going on in the classroom. So this is the split screen, same thing. It's a phone, it's a split screen, but now I'm actually sharing something. So you can see me, I'm at the front of the class and I'm sharing that um, document that's uh, in the little thumbnail. But for this particular student, it was more important for her to watch me talk about it than to just look at a screen um, of the screen share. So um, that's, you know, those are the different um, areas. All right, so do we feel a little bit better about simultaneous instruction? I don't know. That was a lot of information in a very short amount of time. 